find it. So we uh, we talked a bit about functions uh, yesterday. We're going to keep talking about functions today. We'll finish up 1.1, start 1.2. I think we're pretty much on schedule. Um, so the material I want to talk about now is kind of more, sorry, I'm, I'm going to see if I can get some of these windows open without bringing in a lot of noise. It is hot today. Um, so I was saying that the thing we're going to talk about now is sort of more specialized than what we were talking about yesterday. But I mean, it's good material to understand. And we'll use it not, not super frequently, when we in, in this class, I admit, but we'll use it um, in some of the chapter two sections. And that's the concept of a piecewise defined function. And the concept of a piecewise defined function is pretty straightforward. I mean, if you can sort of divorce it from the math, The output of a function might depend on, well, it's a little awkward to frame it where the input is. And what I mean by that, um, it, it requires comment. I mean, suppose you are running a seasonal business, like a ski resort or an ice cream parlor or something like that. Um, the business is going to operate fun in a fundamentally different way, depending on whether you're in season or out of season. Or I, I did work with yeast as a graduate student. Um, yeast consumes nutritional substances in fundamentally different ways depending on how rich the environment is, anaerobic or aerobic. So you can't just create a model for yeast. Your model has to be able to say, here's how the yeast is consuming its nutrients. You can't just create a single model for a seasonal business. Your model has to be able to say, are we in the season or out of season? And that's the idea of a piecewise defined function. And as a mathematical statement, a piecewise defined function, um, well, at least as we're using them in this class, looks like a series of equations. I guess expressions is the technical term. And which expression we use was depends on X. So there's some condition, and if X satisfies that condition, we use the first expression. There's a second condition, and if X 
satisfies some other condition, we use the second example. And we can have as many expressions and as many conditions as we want. Um, so this is something that, I mean, this is true of all math, I suppose, something that will become clearer when we see an example or two. Standard example of a piecewise defined function is called the heavy side function. And the heavy side function is pretty uh, rudimentary. It can only take on two values. And the value it takes depends on whether the input is negative or positive. If the input is negative, the heavy side function is zero. If the input is positive, the heavy side function is one. So H of negative three is what? Zero. Because negative three satisfies the first condition. It's less than zero. H of four is one, four satisfies the second condition, four is positive. Um, heavy side was an electrical engineer. The heavy side function represents the idea that at time zero, we flip a switch. And then once we flip the switch, it stays flipped forever. But um, this has applications outside of electrical engineering. Um, it can be used, we might come back to this just because it's what I did my research in. It can be used in modeling yeast, for example. So yeast cells divide and the way things work is that the yeast cells just stay put until there are enough resources for them to divide, and then they divide. So we can think of staying put as being in state zero, and we can think of division as being in state one, and the heavy side function can be used to represent this transition from state zero to state one. The graph of the heavy side function then looks like this. And you don't, I mean, if this shows up on a test or whatever, I'll remind you, um, this is just an example. It's not something you need to commit to memory. Um, Another classic example of a piecewise defined function is the absolute value. So just like the heavy side function, the absolute value depends on whether the input is positive or negative. Um, so what the absolute value does, I'm not sure if everyone will remember this, it just gets rid of any negative sign. So the absolute value of negative seven is positive seven. 
On the other hand, the absolute value of three is just three. There aren't any negative signs to get rid of, so it doesn't do anything. So if the input is not negative, the absolute value doesn't do anything. If the input is negative, the absolute value flips from negative to positive. And how do you make a negative number positive? Well, two negative signs cancel each other out. So you make a negative number positive by putting a negative sign in front of it. And there's the absolute value. So the absolute value of negative five, we, we look at these conditions and we say, well, negative five is less than zero. So we're in this state. So we put a negative sign in front of it, and our two negative signs cancel, and we get a positive five. And to be sure, you can also, I mean, you can have much more complicated looking um, piecewise defined functions. I mean, I do sometimes feel like Homework exercises and textbooks create complicated examples just for the heck of it. We've seen probably the two most famous piecewise defined functions and they're pretty straightforward, but we could have f of x equals x plus 1, if x is less than a negative 2, and x squared, if x is between negative 2 and positive 2, and x minus 3, if x is greater than two. Um, notice that, um, I mean, assuming that our input can be any real number, we have to say what happens for every real number. It would be an issue if we had something like that. Because then you'd ask, well, what's f of 2.5? And you'd have to say, well, well I don't know. 2.5 isn't in any of those intervals. It would also be an issue if the interval was over length. Because then you'd ask, what's f of 2? And you, well, I don't know. 2 is less than or equal to 2, but 2 is also greater than or equal to 2. So when you see piecewise defined functions like this, you'll notice that those intervals never overlap. Um, and you could have more, well, before I talk about more complicated piecewise defined functions, what's f of um, f of five? Yeah. Two. So students sometimes um, get confused here because they think think we should like evaluate f of five first and then try to decide what piece it's in. Um, I mean, 
Is it five is greater than two? I mean, we just go through the pieces. Is five less than negative two? It is not. Is five between negative two and positive two? It is not. Is five greater than two? It is. So we are using that third equation. <laughs> five minus three is two. And you can have other piecewise defined functions. Um, these are the, the ones we're going to use in the class are, are all look like this. We've got a list of equations and then we've got the real line chopped into intervals and different intervals use different equations. You can have more complicated functions. There's an extremely fit. I, I, I say things like extremely famous and that I feel like I might be abusing that word a little, but there's a piecewise defined function, which is zero if x is irrational. That is, if x cannot be written as a integer divided by another integer, so something like pi or e or the square root of two, And then one if x is rational. Um, so a fraction, one half, three fourths, something like that. And uh, it, it's called the, you don't need to know, but it's called the Dirichlet function. And it has some interesting properties. It's a, it's a very sort of straight irration irrational. It's a good example of a function where we can't actually graph it because the irrational and rational numbers are mixed up so badly. If we try to graph it, we just have an infinite number of points at one and an infinite number of points at zero and they'd be all mixed together. Um, But that's piecewise defined functions. As I say, it ne it's, it's something that probably doesn't really get it to do in this course. We'll use it in chapter two. But if you're ever doing any mathematical modeling, I mean, if you've got a situation and you're trying to write down equations, it's something that's likely to show up. So I don't mind covering it even if it's not used a lot in calculus, it's a tool that everyone should have in their tool belts. And that ends section 1.1. Um, there is no homework on this section. I. I mean, I like Thomas in many ways, or I wouldn't use his textbook, but the chapter one homework, the questions he asks are very weird and don't really, don't really reflect how we're actually going to use the material in later chapters. So, there's no homework on it, but you know, we will be using function notation pretty much every day for the rest of the course. So that's not to say it isn't important. Let me, because we ended a section, let me end this recording.